Hello, I'm Peter Graves, and this is Biography. Consider for a moment the future. What are we going to find as we travel beyond the limits of this world? Just what mysteries lie ahead? Well, for Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, these questions were both a daily exercise and his life's work. Gene was a friend of mine. We first met years ago when we worked together on a Western series called Whiplash. And later, when the original Star Trek series was being produced, I was shooting Mission Impossible on the soundstage next door. Gene Roddenberry's final frontier was his own imagination. He swept his fans along on a great adventure that not only entertained, but also probed critical social issues. Roddenberry's strange new worlds often seem to share an awful lot with our own. Join us for a personal look at this remarkable visionary, as told by his friends and colleagues and family. Biography presents a portrait of Gene Roddenberry. In a way, the Star Trek saga began one summer day under the blistering sun of the Southwest Desert in 1921. Eugene Wesley Roddenberry was born on August 19th that year in El Paso, Texas. And that was where he began to dream and to create his vision of the future. Science fiction is a beautiful game and a beautiful experience. In years to come, Gene Roddenberry would share his imaginary universe with the rest of us, and in doing so, touch many hearts. For me, Gene's vision was the idea of we, not I, but we. And to me, that's amazing, that's great, because we doesn't care about color, doesn't care about gender, you know, it's just we. I like that. Gene was a very complex man, and uh, a very, very bright and creative man. Gene had a very optimistic view of what the future was gonna be. Very gentle, very affectionate, very, very clear thinking, but always had a, a twinkle in his eye. He was as he always was, friendly and charming and very hospitable. Gene was essentially a storyteller. He was an incredible storyteller, as a matter of fact. And not only could he pull the story together, but he could leave that little message on the inside that would really affect people afterwards. The elements that uh, attract Star Trek to so many people is because of the hopefulness inherent in the stories. He had ideas that were definitely ahead of his time. And think that's largely because he spent a lot of time thinking and dreaming. During his 70 years on Earth, Gene Roddenberry never stopped dreaming. If I'm dead, I'll stop thinking about those things. But as long as I am alive, I intend to have fun with uh, ideas as long as possible. His father, Eugene Edward Roddenberry, fought in Europe during World War I. When he returned to the United States, he was stationed at Fort Bliss, Texas, where he met Caroline Goldman. The handsome young cavalry sergeant and the 16-year-old Texas beauty were married and had a son less than a year later. She became pregnant about a month after they were married. As she liked to say, I had a month, so Gene was perfectly legal. Uh, and he kind of, in a way, grew up with his mother. When he was 19 months old, the family moved to Southern California, where his father became a policeman. Gene was a bright student and began reading all the science fiction he could get his hands on. Uh. 
At Los Angeles City College, he studied pre-law and police studies and joined the civilian pilot training program. And by the time he was 19 years old, he was a fully licensed pilot. When Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor plunged the United States into World War II, student pilots were a prized commodity. And after more training, 2nd Lieutenant Roddenberry was anxious to join the war effort. He became a B-17 pilot, uh, principally because he was too big to fly uh, the smaller fighter planes. As a bomber pilot in the South Pacific, Roddenberry was involved in a crash in which his navigator and bombardier were killed. Gene survived to complete a total of more than 80 wartime missions, and he was decorated with the Distinguished Flying Cross. After the war, Roddenberry returned home to his wife, Eileen. They had been married when he started his military training. They had two daughters, Darlene and Dawn. He became a commercial pilot for Pan Am Airlines and experienced another deadly plane crash, this time in the Syrian desert. 14 people died. Roddenberry was the only surviving flight officer and helped evacuate injured passengers from the burning wreckage. After that, Roddenberry decided to try a more grounded career. And like his father before him, he joined the Los Angeles Police Department. He was a policeman and he saw the drama of the street, if you will, for a while. But it was the drama of television that beckoned to him. And as he began to sell scripts to TV producer Fred Ziv, he discovered that writing about make-believe cops and robbers was much more rewarding than chasing the real ones. Gene would be paid uh, $700 for a Ziv script that he could write in roughly a week. Well, at that time, he was making about $440 as a policeman for a full month's work. So $700 for a week's work was terrific. He left the police department and sold scripts to a variety of TV shows, including Dragnet, Highway Patrol, The Naked City, and Have Gun, Will Travel. Typically, Gene, he taught himself. He figured out uh, a methodology on how to teach himself to write to, for television and put it into, into gear. He would watch television shows with the sound turned down so he could learn about blocking. He would turn away and listen to television shows as though they were radio to get the flow of dialogue. And so he could write things intelligently that way. Roddenberry figured out how to sell TV scripts, but that wasn't enough to be able to put his vision on the air. Next, he produced his own series, The Lieutenant, starring Gary Lockwood. It was at this time in the early 60s that Gene met Majel Barrett. The young actress who eventually would become his second wife and the single most influential person in his life. I was in love. It's just that simple. There's nothing more to say about it. It's, uh, um, I was in love. I, I would have followed him anywhere. I would have done anything. I would have gone anywhere. He was an easy man to love. When they weren't working, they enjoyed what time they could find just to be together. Now a producer with some clout, he began to nurture an idea for a show about the adventures of a spaceship with an intergalactic crew. Not an easy sell in an era when westerns and cop shows ruled the airwaves. Took it to MGM first, and, and they turned it down on the basis they thought it was impossible to produce. No one had tried that many opticals and changes of costumes and all of that. I took it to CBS. They listened to it patiently and decided they wanted to go with a, a, uh, a, a kiddie science fiction show. Now, finally, I came to Desilu, which was once, which was here before Paramount bought it. They had tried about a dozen shows, and none of them sold. And I think they got to the point where they said, hell, we'll even try Gene Roddenberry's crazy idea. Gene Roddenberry had wanted to incorporate his real-life experiences 
and his opinions about the nature of humanity into a form other people could share. And he found the perfect vehicle to give life to his imagination, the Starship Enterprise. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Star Trek has become a commercial phenomenon with no end in sight. Television episodes have been shown in more than a hundred countries and translated into 30 languages. Active el plato deflector. Si proyectamos un rayo de partículas, quizá podamos producir un desorden nuclear en el núcleo. Sí, señor. Star Trek novels, which carry on Roddenberry's original concept, have sold more than 32 million copies, making it the best-selling series in publishing history. Oh, yeah. A seventh motion picture began production in 1994. It's the, the, the spread of the Star Trek empire as more and more starships head out with more and more different casts on them, telling more and more stories. Oh. And yet Roddenberry almost didn't get this phenomenon off the ground. It wouldn't have gotten even a chance if Roddenberry hadn't convinced Lucy to love it. And if she hadn't been the head of her own studio, Desilu. Lucille Ball was the great star of CBS. Every year, she signed a new contract. Every year, she squeezed CBS for a little more. Finally, she was to the point where Bill Paley, the chairman of the board and founder of CBS had to fly out here to talk her into signing another contract. And of course, the smart businesswoman that she was, she got more and more out of them. Well, ultimately, she was getting a half a million dollars extra beyond her show and beyond her contract to develop scripts and pilots. And Desi Lu used this money to do the first Star Trek pilot. I sort of explained it like a Western, like wagon train to the stars. Uh, they, they have a zap gun instead of a six shooter, so they don't ride a horse, they ride a spaceship. But I was telling them, hey, fellas, it's just as exciting, you know. Roddenberry had an eight-page outline of the basic Star Trek concept when he pitched his far-fetched idea. I first called it, I think, the Yorktown. Then I decided I thought the Enterprise was a better word. I called him Captain April, Captain Pike. <laughs> Definitely something out there, Captain. Head it this way. As filming began, Roddenberry made many changes. Even the character of Spock underwent quite a transformation. Mr. Spock here. We're intercepting a follow-up message, sir. Originally, the design of the character was that he would be red and that he would be from Mars and he would ingest energy through a plate in his stomach. That's right. Spock was going to be red. I was hired to play the character of Mr. Spock with Jeffrey Hunter playing the captain of the ship. Engage. Disengage! We were the first show to take a shot at f female equality. He wanted a strong woman. He wanted uh, someone who could take command, and he wanted a woman uh, second in command of the starship. At least he didn't go for the captain right off the bat. Roddenberry's big chance to go where no TV producer had gone before was brought crashing down to earth when NBC executives saw the finished one-hour pilot titled The Cage. Well, one of the first things they said they didn't like was uh, I had a woman second in command of the spaceship, and the attitude was, uh, 
uh, nobody's going to believe that. And indeed, to be fair, not even the women in the test audiences believed it. They were writing things like, who does she think she is? It's just that I can't get used to having a woman on the bridge. Jean knew it was going to break my heart, but uh, the second thing they wanted was to get rid of the Spock character because uh, they felt that he was too satanic looking and would, would upset the women out there in television land. I had to have an alien aboard if I'm going to do a spaceship, so I just, and I, I couldn't win every fight, so I got rid of the woman and uh, put Nimoy up higher and gave him some of the, the, some of the woman's qualities, which was a razor sharp brain and logic and all of that. And so Mr. Spock sort of came out of a combination of those things. The word bandied about was cerebral. What we heard was too cerebral. It didn't sell. Pilot did not sell. Fascinating. They also considered it uh, a bit too erotic for its time. There were various things in the show, the, the, the dancing girls, the, the, uh, the use of our guest star Susan uh, in various guises, most of which bore some sort of sexual connotation. Oh, I have to wear something, don't I? Jean wanted half women and half men, but again, NBC said, no, it's going to look like there's too much hanky-panky. So he figured, he says, well, he's, he could give in on that point because he figured 30 good women could handle a crew of 300 anyway. <laughs> Television is, is really uh, the, 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 the art of uh, compromise. You must know where you can compromise and where you should fight. In an unprecedented move, and in spite of their own objections, NBC ordered a second pilot. Ironically, the network had wanted to change all of the cast except for the captain. You stop the delusion or I'll twist your head off. Well, Jeffrey Hunter and his wife were brought in to see the original pilot, and his wife detested every minute of it. We've lost the captain. Do you read? Jeffrey Hunter wasn't obligated to come back for the second pilot, and he elected not to do so. Uh, he thought, and his wife thought, that he was a motion picture star and that his future lay on the big screen rather than the little one. So we had to then find another captain. Enterprise from Kirk. With William Shatner aboard and with Spock surviving through Roddenberry's insistence, a second pilot entitled Where No Man Has Gone Before was completed and again shown to the network executives. It was my fault. I got a chance to write this pilot and I, and I was going to be action adventure movement, but I, I did get into some uh, things about the difference between reality and dreams and all of that. So the second one was a little more action adventure and it sold the show. A total recasting took place of all the other characters. Bill Shatner came on board, DeForest Kelly, Jimmy Doon, all the rest, George Duke, and Michelle Nichols, Walter Koenig. And um, this time it worked. At least worked well enough to get us on the air. I believe there's some hope for you after all, Mr. Spock. The voyages of the Starship Enterprise were underway. But it would be far from smooth sailing for Gene Roddenberry either in front of the camera or behind it. Gene Roddenberry populated the Star Trek stories with parts of his own personality, and he used his own experiences to give life to the fictional characters. The combat pilot, the cop, the son of the cavalry officer, they could all be found on duty aboard the Starship Enterprise. Nowhere on television was one man's vision so personified as on Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. Captain's Log, star date 1513.1. On Thursday night, September 8th, 1966, television viewers got their first glimpse of Star Trek in this episode called Man Trap. Over the next three seasons, as the fictional crew struggled with numerous adversaries, Gene Roddenberry was waging even more dramatic battles with TV deadlines. We started off, as most shows start off, with not sufficient scripts in hand. In fact, I think we only had about one or two. And we were one jump ahead of the sheriff all the way down that first season. We were delivering episodes to the network 
at times on the very day that they were broadcast. Uh, and it was horrendous. Gene worked on those scripts because I know I was there with him. Um, I would say at least three to four nights a week, and sometimes all weekend long, uh, until maybe two, three, four o'clock in the morning. I can remember walking up to the set and delivering, um, delivering sheets of paper to them that were scripts just from working all night long. It was 12 hours a day, six days a week. Uh, uh, I, 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 children I was raising at the time for like three years, I hardly saw them. It's, they can't pay you enough for that. When you're young and you want to show the world, you do it. But, uh, oh, the, the price is enormous. I've got to tell you, the first two years were just plain hell. And it went on night and day. Despite the turmoil to get the shows on the air, the quality of the episodes remained high, and people tried to maintain their sense of humor. I developed uh, a methodology with him, working with him during the first season when rewrites were needed and he was late churning them out and the people on the stage were waiting for him. I would had access to his office at any time. I could walk in and say to him, you know, where are the pages, Gene? And I'd come in and he'd be sitting at his desk writing with uh, a number two pencil or a number one pencil and a legal pad. And uh, I knew we, we desperately needed those pages. And so one day, a wild thought struck me, and I jumped up onto his desk while he was writing and stood there looking down at him, and he pretended not to notice. And he just kept on writing. And, and, but when he finished it, he handed me the pages up, and I jumped off his desk and ran out with them and you know, got him to the stage and uh, got everything prepared. After that, whenever he wasn't on time with the rewrite, I would just walk into his office, stand on his desk, and wait, and he would always make certain not to notice me, you know, but uh, it, became, uh, it became our routine, and uh, I think we both secretly enjoyed it a lot. Even when the scripts were delivered on time, Roddenberry had to struggle with the TV censors. Constantly scrapes with the censors. One of the worst for me was when I had a belly button shown in a dance, and they decided that you cannot show belly buttons, they made me recut the entire picture. Of course, the next year, Laugh-In came out, belly buttons were in, it would have been okay. I was very angry about this, and years later, when I was doing another science fiction thing, I started to design an alien woman, and I said, I'll give her two belly buttons. NBC owes me one. Because it was being presented as fiction taking place on faraway planets and involving alien civilizations, Roddenberry explored many serious social issues involving such TV taboo subjects as war, race, politics, religion, and sex. Kiss me. It had a comment on this and that. Not deep philosophical comment, but, but still comment on, on uh, equality of all humans and, and, uh, and the uh, re respect for life forms we should have. What happened, Captain? Roddenberry turned the escalation of the Vietnam War into one script. If this planet is to develop in the way it should, we must equalize both sides again. Jim, that means you're condemning this whole planet to a war that may never end. It could go on for year after year, massacre after massacre. All right, Doctor! Racial tension and prejudice were portrayed with the help of aliens in half-white, half-black makeup. Kill him! All the people are dead. All dead, Captain. They have annihilated each other. Totally. Star Trek was ahead of its time in the 60s. Many people just didn't get it. Uh, my own father, he, he was sat there the first night Star Trek was on the air. And he waited and saw the whole thing. They went out and apologized to all the neighbors. He ran around the neighborhood telling uh, everyone, don't worry, Gene will be back to writing good stuff real soon. We're getting back to writing real television 
writing westerns. Roddenberry stuck to his guns, or rather his phasers. The frontiers he wanted to explore had nothing to do with cowboys and Indians. This was the way it was in those days. We, we weren't, no one, we didn't have uh, scientists going around talking about the probability of extraterrestrial life. So we were, we were to a lot of people a bunch of nuts. The episodes did have to be entertaining and had to be delivered on time, which led to certain formulas that had to be followed. Where else in a real honest to God uh, situation could you ever find, I don't care whether it's yesterday, today, or tomorrow, uh, a, a bunch of, of women running around in a starship with big bouffant hairdos, little short skirts on, and knee boots. Although they were wearing these ridiculous little skirts, you have to remember that at the time, that, that was a real badge of freedom. That was women saying, I don't have to be a little mousy housewife. I can wear something attractive. It was very stupid. Nobody could work in that go-go boat outfit, but it was an avant-garde thing at the time. And where the captain leaves the ship every week to go down to the planet and romance some broad, leaving behind some poor little ensign. If he happens to be wearing a red shirt, he's going to die before the episode is over anyway. In the last original Star Trek episode, Turnabout Intruder, Captain Kirk finds himself trapped in the body of a woman. On June 3, 1969, a bad time slot and low ratings did what the Klingon Empire never achieved and that was to knock Roddenberry's Enterprise off the air after only 79 episodes. Ironically enough, it was real science that rescued science fiction from oblivion. What had happened, see, after we were canceled, man landed on the moon. And then the people were saying, oh, I won't watch this nonsense. Suddenly it became real. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. After Star Trek was canceled, there were also big changes in Roddenberry's personal life. A divorce and a trip to Japan to scout movie locations for MGM. Majel was uh, at our place when Jean was in Japan, and he called her at our house and proposed to her. It was romantic. It, it really was. He said, Majel, come on over. He said, let's do a ceremony over, over here. We had to rent uh, outfits for it, and I, you know, I had my face all painted all white and those big, heavy things. They weigh about 40 pounds. I know why they stand that way now. Those, those little girls, they stand that way and they take little short steps. You don't dare stride, the head will fall off. And the hat is going, and, and you have to stand real still, and the teacup comes up like this. There's a reason for all that. I didn't know that before. You couldn't behave like we do in the Western world. My goodness, you'd fall apart. But uh, it, was, it was a lovely ceremony. In 1974, five years after they were married, Majel and Jean had a son, Eugene Rod. One of the biggest joys of his life was watching his son grow up. Hey, Ron, dad, 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 dad. There are more than 100 companies licensed to produce Star Trek merchandise. 
That merchandise has generated sales of more than $650 million. In 1979, ten years after the original Star Trek series went off the air, and with Roddenberry having become an important member of the Paramount Studio family, the Enterprise and its crew made the leap into motion pictures. Five feature film sequels have followed, with a total box office of half a billion dollars. But in the 1970s, Roddenberry had desperately tried to create an image for himself outside of Star Trek. He wanted to be known as a producer of other shows, and after Star Trek, his ideas led to several projects. He even wrote and produced a dark comedy feature film, Pretty Maids All in a Row, starring Rock Hudson. He was greatly in demand on the college lecture circuit and received three honorary doctorates, including one from Emerson College in Boston. We have within reach now the attainment of almost every dream of mankind. And in 1987, Gene Roddenberry handpicked the next generation of Starfleet officers and brought Star Trek back into primetime television. I'm a Klingon, sir. For me to seek escape when my captain goes into battle. You are a Starfleet officer, Lieutenant. He was a quintessential producer that you want to work with, basically, because he was, he was on the set quite a bit. Enterprise. This is Commander Riker at Farpoint Station, standing by to beam up. Roddenberry took me under his uh, wing, if you will, early on and said to me, I like you for this part, and I like you because I, rep I, re I recognize the Machiavellian glint in your eye, <laughs> which he compared to his own eye and glint. Let's see what's out there. Engage. He was, I think, very proud of us and very proud of how we achieved the early success of the show. Critics doubted that Roddenberry could reignite the magic, but then he had always liked being challenged by the odds. I am a writer. The way Paramount uh, interested me in this one, they said it's impossible to do again, at which point my ears perked up. It was also Roddenberry's chance to change some of the things in Star Trek that he wasn't happy about the first time around. He regretted so many of those things later. He said that uh, he said, I, I, there were Klingons around, and he said, uh, Klingons are, aren't real. They couldn't possibly be because they were all bad. There is no such thing as an all bad race. Sir, respectfully submit our only choice is to fight. <laughs> I think he did rectify the situation because it, it um, first of all, he made uh, with, with Worf. Worf is, is a part of the, the Enterprise crew. He's part of Starfleet, so he couldn't be all evil. So I have a feeling that more than anything else, those kind of, of mistakes were what, uh, uh, were, were what prompted him, you know, to go into the next generation. Through it all, Majel has appeared in every incarnation of Star Trek, from second in command in the first pilot, to being demoted to Nurse Chapel in the original series, to being promoted to Dr. Chapel in the motion picture, 
to the irrepressible Lwaxana Troy in Star Trek The Next Generation, and to being heard as the voice of the Enterprise computer. Star Trek The Next Generation was on the air seven years, and with 15 to 20 million viewers per week, was the highest rated first run syndicated drama series in television history. Star Trek fans, unlike fans of other programs, feel a very close connection to the vision behind the stories and to Roddenberry, the creator of that vision. He's given us something to, to dream about. Gene Roddenberry has left a legacy of hope for the future. Hope that my kids will have a really nice environment to grow up in. I think he was a man of very, very profound vision, one that we would indeed survive and survive very well. His vision was that someday in the future, we can put away our weapons and our spears and turn it into plowshares. They had the first Star Trek convention in 1972 in New York, and this was a convention happily attended by thousands of people to celebrate a television show that had been off the air for years and had been labeled a failure. Today, Star Trek conventions are as traditional as Fourth of July celebrations and are attended by hundreds of thousands of fans. I'm kind of an original series guy. You are? Guy. Fabulous. Yeah. Let's put you in that one. Let's look good in polyester. <laughs> Can you chin up just a touch? Wonderful, perfect. Part of Gene Roddenberry's legacy is that his science fiction of the 1960s has turned into the science fact of today, including compact voice-activated computers, mobile handheld communicators, computerized medical beds that help diagnose illness, laser weapons, and the idea of warp speed. With new movies coming out, the continuation of new episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, reruns of the original series and Star Trek The Next Generation, and production on another TV series, Star Trek Voyager, the saga is assured a certain kind of immortality, an immortality its creator did not have. When he wasn't contemplating the future of the galaxy, Gene Roddenberry made himself very much at home here on Earth. He knew how to enjoy life, whether it was on vacation with Majel when they could get away, together on the golf course, or on the open seas on his sailboat. He loved the outdoors, he loved sailing. Oh gosh, he loved sailing. The thing I remember uh, uh, best about Gene is that uh, he was a fabulous navigator, and, uh, but a terrible engineer. We were out on the way to uh, Avalon, and uh, so we started the engine up, and half an hour later, uh, it stopped, and uh, when we finally limped into Avalon Harbor about 9.30 at night, Gene called up a mechanic and uh, was checking the engine. He says, you ran out of gas. And Gene looked at me and he was very, very shy of, uh, about that because uh, I had suggested stopping and loading up with gas before we came along, you know, and everything else. So I had my checklist after that. But anyway, that's what I call him a lousy engineer. <laughs> In the late 80s, his spirit and his mind very much intact, Gene Roddenberry's health began to fail him. It was, uh, it was sad, but it was not a surprise. I mean, he was very ill. We saw less and less of them, less and less of him as the, uh, as the time went on. We used to look forward to the visits. They'd come down once a day, once a week, then it became once every couple of weeks. Then we wouldn't see him for a month, and we'd see him in a wheelchair, and it was, it was, uh, it was very sad. 
By that time, he had passed along the responsibility of Star Trek to executive producer Rick Berman. I owe a great deal to him because he, he laid this legacy of Star Trek on my shoulders, and uh, it's something that I, I plan to take very good care of for as long as I'm connected with it. Many of the people left to carry on the Star Trek legacy feel they owe something to Gene Roddenberry. I think his vision is for, I mean, to, to quote somebody, is, is a kinder, gentler universe where we're not out there just blasting away and, and bullying people uh, around the galaxy. I liked his spirit. I liked his uh, toughness. The fact that he stood up to the network and stood up to the studio and made uh, demands that ultimately were met, if not on previous projects, certainly when it came to Next Generation. Um, I think that the show went the way it did because he dictated it so. The episode Hero Worship was being filmed on the Paramount lot in Hollywood on October 24th, 1991, when word came down that Gene Roddenberry had died of heart failure. Rick Berman came onto the set and touched me on the shoulder and said, I, I need to have a word with you. And he took me aside and took me out to the trailer. I knew that it was important because uh, you, know, you don't stop production in a drama series that easily. And, uh, that Gene had died very suddenly. My close-up was coming up in a scene, and Rick Berman came down to the set and told us that Gene had died, and it's very difficult for me to get through this. Um, my father had died on the same day 10 years earlier, so it was, it was a double whammy, because I kind of felt like Gene was my um, kind of surrogate father. We, I'd, they kind of adopted me, as a daughter, you know, with Major playing my mother and everything, it was, uh, I just felt like part of the family. So it, it was, um, it was a very, very tough day for me. I was 38 when my second parent died. And I do remember the very, the very first feeling I had was, well, who will look after me now? And I had something of that feeling about Jean. Who, who take care of us now? Gene's gone, because even though he wasn't here very much, his presence was constant. Gene had been on his way to his doctor's office for a routine check when something suddenly went very wrong. Gene had difficulty breathing, and they brought some oxygen out to him. Majel got down on her hands and knees and held his head on her lap and talked to him, comforting him, reassuring him. And at that moment, the doctor stepped over and immediately began CPR and said, get the family out of here. And Majel instantly said no. And there was no more argument to that. After about 40 minutes or so, uh, the doctor came out and just said that they weren't able to bring him back. And he was gone. And that was the last time I saw Gene Roddenberry. I'm not so sure that... Um... I'm not so sure he's gone yet. I, um, I really haven't come to, uh, to deal with that, I'm afraid. There's so much that's going on that is still happening that uh, um, I, I expect to walk in, I expect him to be here. One of his fondest wishes escaped him while he was still alive, but a space shuttle astronaut paid the ultimate tribute to Gene Roddenberry's memory. He would have loved to have gone into space, very much so. Gene did get a chance, finally, to go into space. His ashes were taken up by the shuttle. Gene Roddenberry is gone, but his dreams and his hopes for the future are very much alive. The voyages of the Starship Enterprise have become more than just fond memories from our television past. They've become a part of our modern mythology, reflections of today, and who knows, maybe roadmaps for tomorrow. <laughs>